Should I start? Okay. Hi, how are you? So, um, so my name is Nalima Sagel. I'm a professor at Stony Brook University um, in cosmology, and my main area of focus is the cosmic microwave background. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yes? Okay. Okay, so I have here and also on your wiki an outline probably an ambitious outline of what I'd like to cover in the four lectures. So, um, so for lecture one, I wanted to just give you a sense of the initial discovery of the CMB, why it's important, why it's a linchpin of our hot Big Bang model, and what the physics of recombination is for the smooth, homogeneous universe. And it's a little bit challenging to start these lectures without building up whole cosmology theory. Who has taken a cosmology course out of curiosity? Or a general relativity course? Okay. Okay. So I'm sort of going to assume that you're familiar with a lot of that stuff. Um, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. You can ask during the lectures. And if it's something that requires extensive discussion over coffee break, we'll just continue over coffee. I'll just, because I want to get through a lot of things. So in lecture two, I'll try and um, describe the Kobe results. And then in order to understand the Kobe results and the fluctuations in the CMB, we actually have to understand um, linear perturbation theory. And I'll try and sketch, because there's no way I can cover it all, you know, the coupled Boltzmann equations and what we would solve to understand, to get that power spectrum that you're all probably familiar with, that iconic picture. And then uh, in lecture three, um, I'll go into a little bit of why the CMB is polarized and um, show you what some of the power, power spectra look like. So in this lecture, I'll just do on the board. And then I'll sort of bring in more slides and animations because there's no way I could sketch on the board just how impressive the data is with the teeny tiny error bars. Um, and let's see here. Okay. Back. Already too long speaking. In okay. So I want to then sketch out for you why varying the parameters how it impacts the power spectrum and why the CMB is so powerful in constraining the parameters of our universe. And then um, I'm going to briefly discuss the latest Planck results from just this past year and what are some of the outstanding tensions. And in the last lecture four, which I haven't written yet, <laughs> um, but it's not till Friday, I will discuss uh, <laughs> I will uh, discuss some of the most exciting new physics that people in our community are interested in, that I'm interested in, and in particular, um, nailing down N effective, which I'll discuss what it is, uh, measuring the sum of the neutrino mass, and then uh, the scalar to tensor ratio, which measures primordial gravity waves, which you've probably all heard a lot about. And I'll tell you about um, upcoming experiments, and you'll, you'll see like this little uh, ACT here, just to give you a sense. I work on one of the uh, main CMB experiments called ACT, which is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. It's in Chile, and there are some other telescopes in the South Pole. Um, although primarily we'll talk a lot about Planck results, because uh, those were the latest satellite results. Although going forward, it's a ground-based experiment, so I'll make the most progress. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the outline. So let me move that up, and I'm done with, should be done with this for the day. So, um, okay, so 
lecture one, where to start. So, okay, so the idea that we have a hot Big Bang model of the universe, so let's see, giant chalk. <laughs> so hot Big Bang model, which is that the universe started in this very dense, opaque, um, hot state, naturally projects a CMB. And this was realized in 1948 already. So if you remember your history a little bit, in 1929, Hubble already had his observations of the expanding universe. So we already knew that the universe was expanding. And um, Hubble even took Einstein to his telescope. And you know, I have a photograph of Einstein looking through the Lick Observatory and seeing, um, seeing Hubble's observations. In 1948, people were thinking about um, how the elements formed, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And around that time, there's a paper. There's actually a set of 13 papers. So this one was with Alpha and Herman. There's also um, Gamow, who was a mentor to them. And they had a set of papers. But in this one, the reason why I mentioned this one is that they predicted the CMB. There, what, there is a CMB with a temperature of 5 Kelvin. And um, it's sort of a famous paper because they were so close to the actual observed value of the CMB. So actually, the TCMB, the average value, is about 2.726 Kelvin. So they were really close. However, the way that they got to this involved a series of sort of inconsistencies and they, you know, actually so, so easily they could have gotten a number that was considerably larger, 18 Kelvin or something. And there's a nice discussion, um, a 2013 paper by Jim Peebles where he goes over these papers very nicely, this set of 13 papers, and he, he walks you through how they got to that prediction. So they needed to know, they needed to know something about when elements formed and the time of BBN. So they sort of figured that they knew that the time of BBN, the temperature was about 10 to the 9 Kelvin. That's what made sense to form elements. And they also needed to know the density of baryons early on and the density of baryons now. And through some, again, through some sort of inconsistencies and slight um, not quite right things, they got to the right answer. OK. So that, that was that. That's great. Then in the 1960s, so it kind of went away for a while. People didn't pay much attention. And then in the 1960s, there was people like um, Dickey at Princeton. There was Zeldovich. And these people were rediscovering that prediction. And they were starting to pay attention. And um, let me say one thing, which I skipped over. If you have, let's see, let's, I'm going to start with this stuff. So if you have a homogeneous universe, homogeneous universe. So homogeneous means there's no special place in the universe. So if I stood there, I would see the same physics as if I stood there or there or there. So no special place. The, we assume what goes into the calculations of the smooth 
universe, and actually all our calculations are that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic means no preferred direction, okay? We assume those two things when we do our calculations, but all our evidence shows that on scales, not the size of this classroom, because obviously we're not homogeneous, but on large scales, like 50 megaparsecs or so, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So if you have a homogeneous universe measured by an expansion parameter, A of t, so that's how we'll describe our expansion, then then this expansion, if we started out with some bath of radiation, some bath in thermal equilibrium, then the expansion is going to naturally cause the temperature of that thermal bath to decrease. Okay? So I think this chalk like forces you to write really slow. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Is it? I think it's good. You can see in the back, right? Okay, okay. So, um, then, so the expansion of a sea of thermal radiation decreases the temperature in the universe just as the inverse of A. Okay? So, so the path of our radiation is going to set the temperature of our universe. And the expansion will cause that temperature as a function of time to fall is 1 over A. But it will still preserve a black body spectrum. Okay? Preserving black body. Okay. So that's why... Those initial papers could go from, okay, I think the temperature of the universe is 10 to the 9 Kelvin at the time of Big Bang nuclear synthesis, and I'll, I'll say in words what that is. And then they could try and estimate, well, then what's the temperature today, okay, with some assumptions of the density of baryons at that time and the density today, and then some, they had a measurement that was wrong, actually, of the Hubble constant, which is a measure of the expansion rate today. So anyway, through all of that, they came to their prediction. Okay. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So normally, we assume homogeneity to have uh, a scaling parameter in the metric. Then you're saying we can actually determine whether the universe is homogeneous or not by determining a which goes theoretically we assume homogeneous and then isotropic. Yeah. Then we have FRW with a single scale detector. Yeah. So error goes in this direction. Uh -huh. But you're saying we can measure the homogeneous of the, the way we measure, so for example, when we measure the CMB, we see the fluctuations um, that are basically the same except to one part in ten to the minus five. So that puts limits on uh, how isotropic our universe is, because it looks the same in every direction. When I say we measure this, I mean like um, we have, for example, galaxy redshift surveys. So um, homogeneity is a little bit more challenging than isotropy, right? Yeah. So galaxy redshift surveys, like all of that suggests isotropy. But when we make these three-dimensional maps of galaxy redshift surveys, we can say, okay, if, any, if I was at any other point, I would see the same thing, right? So it's with our data that we say we have no evidence for deviations from hom homogeneity and isotropy yeah. today. Say that again? 
Um, I'm, I'm just assuming it. I'm assuming homogeneity and isotropy in this expansion, okay? Um, without homogeneity and isotropy, right, you need that, right. So let's stick in here, isotropy. Okay, very good. Great, so what happened was in 1964, so as I said, people were starting to rediscover this prediction. So the natural thing is, okay, well, there's supposed to be this C and B, let's measure it. If we measure it, the reason why it was such a big deal is it would really um, tell us that we do have this hot Big Bang model, right? Because nothing else could make a CMB, okay? Unless you started out from this hot, dense state. So in 1964, you had a number of people from Princeton. So Dickey, Peebles, Roll and Wilkinson. And their plan was to look for this CMB and build a radiometer. Radiometer. Now why a radiometer? Because when this, the CMB, which is light from this um, opaque dense state, those photons were very hot, but as they traveled to us today, they were redshifted. So you could calculate what part of the spectrum you should see those photons today, and you should see them in the radio. So that's why CMB, well, we say radio, now we say microwave, microwave frequencies. Um, so I think in terms of gigahertz, so what we're talking about is around like 100 gigahertz or so. They might have been going lower at the time. And in millimeters, I think we're talking about two millimeters. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, two millimeters. So they wanted to go out and measure this, and they were starting to get their equipment together. Peebles was a grad student at the time. And Peebles, I don't know if you say it's a mistake or not, went and gave talks, maybe job talks. So he went to Amherst, he gave a talk, nothing actually happened. Then he went to um, Johns Hopkins and he gave a talk and there was somebody in the audience, actually now the name of the person escapes me, but he was friends with um, Arno Penzias and, uh, Wilson, and Robert Wilson. So he heard Peebles talk. So what else was happening in 1964? So when you're a grad student, you might want to be a little bit careful to give the talk after the paper is published. <laughs> but anyway, so people was going around giving talks and saying, okay, we're going to build this thing. We're going to look for this um, relic of the early, hot, dense, opaque universe. And in 1964, at the same time, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson We're at Bell Labs in New Jersey, and they were building a radiometer too. And they were building a radiometer primarily for satellite communications, maybe a little bit of astronomy. So, both are still alive, I think. Well, Wilson definitely pen think Penzias was shopping at my local, um, what do we, what's in New Jersey now? Not Safeway, Stop and Shop or something like that. So, and uh, Pe Jim Peebles is at Princeton too. As I said, he just wrote that 2013 paper on all of these, you know, sorting out the history. So he's still very active. So building radiometer for satellite communication. And they had some excess noise in the system. So 
so they weren't sure what the noise was. Robert Wilson, so we just celebrated um, 50 years of the CMB because obviously something's going to happen in 1965. And then we were at 2015, so that's uh, 50 years of the CMB. So Wilson gave a talk, we were all at Princeton, and he explained the story. And they had the excess noise. They did think it was pigeons, like pooping in the feed horns. They cleaned the pigeon stuff, it was still there. They actually, and I was happy to at least hear this part, they did try and round up all the pigeons in cages and send them to some farm. But apparently they were homing pigeons, so they just came back again. So that's why they shot all the pigeons. <laughs> I mean, at least they tried to give them a home, right? But then in the name of science, they did shoot the pigeons. And... Um, and the noise was still there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, as I said, Jim Peebles was giving talks at Johns Hopkins. And there was a fellow in the audience that was friends with Arno Penzias and Rob Wilson. And that guy said to these guys, hey, I just heard this talk in Johns Hopkins. These guys are saying they're supposed to be like this sort of 5K background thing. And what, what were they saying? They were, I think forget exact number, I think they had like something like a three Kelvin background or something like that. It's in their paper. So they had some background. And um, so that guy said, you know, maybe this is what you've got. So then, as Robert Wilson recounts, they phoned, Dickie was having a group meeting at Princeton, so they're all there. And uh, I think Penzias was on the phone and had a 40-minute conversation with Dickie, where at the end of which, Dickie did apparently put down the phone and say, well, boys, I think we've been scooped. So what happened was, in 1965, um, there was two papers that came out. So there was one paper by Penzias and Wilson, that was a two-page paper. I think you can find it on Ads Abs. Two pages gets you the Nobel Prize. You don't need to do more than that. So, um, so that paper was two pages. Uh, Penzias and Wilson. And then the companion paper was by Dickie Peebles, Roland Wilkinson saying, this is what we think it is. So the two-page paper was really the measurement paper. And as Wilson said, they weren't even 100% sure that these theorists were completely right. So they didn't really want to necessarily be you know, pinned down to that in their paper. So they wrote their measurement paper. Then these guys wrote the theory paper. Although remember, there were previous papers before laying out the theory and saying we expect this. Um, and then as actually is the case in cosmology, and so maybe that's a little bit different in particle theory, uh, the measurement got the Nobel Prize. And uh, so I guess in particle theory, it's like big teams do the measurement, and then the one uh, Higgs, who I think that was like a two-page paper too, right? Something small. I, I'm not sure, but I, I know it was like publish one thing and then relax. Um, so anyway. In cosmology, it tends to be the people doing the measurement that have traditionally been getting the Nobel Prize. So, and there have been a number in CMB because um, it, it is, has been just so powerful. So the reason why this got the Nobel Prize is because it really was a, a big pillar supporting this hot Big Bang idea. Okay, but so far we've just measured that there's some CMB background. Um, we haven't yet confirmed that it's a black body spectrum. That comes later in the 1990s with the COBE results, which we'll talk about uh, next class. Okay, so, so that's great. So what, what, what's some of the physics that's going on during this time? 
Okay, so now let us sort of sketch out the thermal history of the universe. If you see the CMB, you're really hard pressed to figure out what else could have caused it. And then especially as the reason why um, the Kobe results generated their own Nobel Prize was that pinned down that the CMB was a black body spectrum. It's practically impossible to get a black body unless you have a hot, dense, opaque state. And then in addition, the fluctuations that were measured were one part in 10 to the minus 5. So then you had to explain how in every direction um, you have C and B that basically knows to be all at exactly the same temperature to one part in 10 to the minus 5. So you're pretty hard pressed to get away from a hot Big Bang model. Okay, so now. Say that again? The, the thing about the one part is not the generic feature of the Big Bang model. That's not. The, so, Kobe, the Nobel was for two parts. One was for the black body, separate one was for the fluctuations. And um, it was not because, so I, yes, so there's a difficulty, and that's why we have to have inflation to explain how the universe could have been so isotropic. But what it suggested was that the level of fluctuations at the time of the CMB were big enough to seed the structures we see today. So it was making that connection, not, I, not how did those fluctuations get there. It was just saying it confirmed this idea that we started with small inhomogeneities and then built up to the structure we see today. That's why. OK, great questions. OK. so. Now let's go through different thermal history. And um, yeah, I, w I won't spend so much time talking about inflation. So um, yeah, so let me just emphasize once more in a sentence how those fluctuations are, te are one part in 10 to the minus 5 is a problem. And um, we call this the horizon problem. So there are Three problems, there's a horizon problem, flatness problem is a separate issue, and the monopole problem, and inflation was created to solve those three problems. But then inflation has its own problems. So actually, maybe I'll touch a little bit on this in the, in the last lecture. Okay. okay, so now let's do the history of the universe instead of the history of finding the CMB. So in the early universe, radiation was dominating the dynamics. Okay, so in the early universe, radiation dominates. Okay, so from general relativity, and this is this is my sort of segue into an FRW metric. All you need to know is from general relativity, and the assumption that the universe is smooth and isotropic, okay, the universe is, is smooth homogeneous and isotropic and isotropic we get this thing which some people have been talking about which is called this FRW metric now I'm not going to write too much detail about this metric in this lecture. In the next lecture, we're actually going to perturb this metric. So right now, we're talking about the smooth universe. But there's nothing special here. All, all it is is you take GR, 
And what's critical is that you assume a homogeneous and isotropic universe that's smooth, because right now we're talking about just the background cosmology in this lecture. And the FRW metric pops out. Okay? And what you can show is that you can't get any other metric but the FRW metric. Okay? So if you're trying to like do your, you know, some sort of fancy, some other kind of metric, go through a derivation of how you get the FRW metric and if you do have some other supergravity metric or something, make sure that it actually makes physical sense, right, when you do that. Okay, so when you get the FRW metric, then from this, you get that the expansion parameter is proportional to t to the one half, okay? You get this for, so your FRW metric will be general. You'll have um, different components that can dominate the dynamics. So matter will, will do different things to your space-time expansion. Radiation will do different things. Say if you have a dark energy component, it'll do something different. And also the geometry will change the dynamics. So the FRW metric is going to be general including all of those terms. And if you have a radiation-dominated universe that's flat, then you're going to find that the expansion parameter how our universe expands is going to be proportional to time to the one half. So the, so the FRW metric is going to relate how the energy, matter and energy components and the geometry affect the space time of the universe and the expansion of the universe. And what I mean by flat is I mean locally flat. I mean that parallel lines go straight at any position. So when we talk about flat or positively curved or negatively curved, we mean locally, okay? So if parallel lines are going straight and your universe is radiation dominated, then that's how the expansion of the universe will go. And early on, let me write this over here. Why do I say flat? Because early on, universe is flat to good approximation. Very early on. When the horizon size, so what I mean by horizon is effectively you can think of it as a causally correct connected region, right? So early on, I my horizon size is small, right? Because I can only know about the particles in my vicinity. But later on, my horizon size keeps expanding, okay? And I can know about more and more in my universe. So the horizon size is something that will continually expand as my universe expands. And when the horizon is much, much less than the radius of curvature of the universe, then flatness is a good approximation, right? So if we're kind of close, right, so unless, it, you know, the horizon size on the times we're talking about is very tiny, and for all extensive purposes, parallel lines will look like they go straight. Okay, so that's why I say flat there. Okay, so we also said, okay, so we said that T is going to be proportional to 1 over A of T. So it's going to be proportional to 1 over root time. So as the universe expands, it cools. <laughs> and 
And this fact is the key to why we are going to get the CMB in the first place. I haven't yet, I haven't yet actually told you what the physics is of why we're getting the CMB or why we see it. So just to give you a sense, okay, of in cosmology, we talk about sort of major epochs in the thermal history of the universe. So let me list some of these. So the first thing we're going to have when we have very hot temperatures is a relativistic plasma. And I haven't yet defined redshift. I'll define it just as soon as I'm done with this list. But what we're talking about here is redshifts larger than 10 to the 10. We've got this relativistic plasma going on. Yes. Good question. It's in the FRW metric. There is this par parameter that's a radius of curvature. Um, it turns out that you actually never need to know that specific number. It 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 all gets encapsulated either into it all kind of effectively gets c encapsulated into this curvature parameter. And so then what we really talk about is when this curvature parameter, um, we'll define it a little bit later, but when it's zero, we say that the universe is flat. And then we effectively, whenever it's positive, we say that we have positive curvature. And whenever it's negative, we say we have negative curvature. And we don't ever really, so when it's flat, this radius of curvature is infinite. And then when it's positive or negative, we tend not to actually care about that number. We care about what's the deviation from flatness locally, basically. So we don't, even though it's in the FRW metric, we actually never, we don't calculate it or have it carried around or worry about it too much. It, it, we, we talk in terms of this, and we subsume that into this parameter. Yeah. Say that again? I'm talking about parallel lines. So, um, whether parallel lines are diverging or coming together or going straight within you, you know, around you, you know, is what I'm talking about. With or not, on, not even necessarily on the whole scale of your horizon, but just, I'm just talking about parallel lines. That's all I'm talking about. So I think you, you probably, well, okay. Is that clear? Is that, okay. Say, so, I'm just, oh, okay, say that, it, say it again, I think, yes, yes, say it again. So, so there are three possible solutions to the system. Right. That's right. And, but for that, the K plus one minus one is not describing your global topology. It's describing um, local, what you would see with parallel lines, but that could, it's a little vague within what uh, radius I'm talking about when I'm saying that. But I'm just trying to say that it's not necessarily describing your global topology. So if you will describe a local curvature. Sure. Then it's a local curvature. I'm to... 
Yeah. So um, what I'm trying to say here is let us go a little backwards and say, well, we know something about our data. We know we don't deviate a huge amount from flatness right R right now so we're kind of close to flat and if our horizon size was larger we would see the deviation from flatness more we would it would be clearer but when our horizon size is really tiny we can't we can't really probe that and everything's going to look kind of flat yeah how, how would you measure it? how do we measure it uh with the cmd we'll get there we get there. Just to give you fast forward, the first peak of the CMB, when you have that iconic picture of the power spectrum, that first peak is basically telling us our universe is pretty close to flat. That position, the position where it is in, in L space, which is setting an angular scale, that's actually telling us our universe is pretty close to flat. We'll get there. We'll get there. We will get there. Get, we will get that's all of this. Yes, I have some animations even. We'll get there. Okay, so um, early on we have relativistic plasma. Then what happens is uh, the neutrinos that are mixed up in that relativistic plasma actually decouple. Okay, and that happens at around z of 10 to the about z of 10 to the 10, actually. So this is larger than z of 10 to the 10, and this happens about then. So the neutrinos, which are kept in equilibrium by the weak interaction, the universe cools such that, so remember, the universe is cooling and expanding, and if the reaction rate isn't happening fast enough, then that the reaction is going to stop. Basically, if the universe expands so fast and you, the cross-section um, isn't high enough and the reaction rate isn't high enough, we, the reaction stops and we call that freezing out. So the neutrinos freeze out at this point and they decouple and then they just free stream to us and don't do anything more except adding to our temperature of the universe because they're still, they still do something, um, but they just free stream, basically. So then we have all of these E plus and E minus particles around. Just, yep. I'm getting, I will just, as soon as I finish this list, define what Z is. So for now, just think of it as a time coordinate, a time coordinate. And I could have put, um, uh, this happens at one second after the Big Bang. One second after Big Bang, just to give you a sense. BB. So here we're still talking pre a second. You look confused. No. Oh. No, no. What do you mean about Big Bang? Because like uh, I in this lecture I'm not going to talk about t equals zero exactly, but I'm going to use. Um, we know the physics of the universe very well going backwards. And we know, we understand one second prior to this Big Bang, like we understand the physics. We understand neutrino decoupling. BBN happens in the first three minutes. That, all the, phys, all the theory matches all the observations. And even, even here we understand what's going on. When we talk about things like inflation, we're talking about things like 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang. Okay, so when we're saying, oh, we don't understand early universe, when we mean early universe, we mean early universe, right? <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. That's the murky zone, okay? That's, you know, I mean, okay, we might not know every, every detail, but the LHC, you know, we know all the particles that we've seen in particle physics we understand what's going on at higher and higher energies. And say if the LHC finds some stuff at even higher energies, that will fill in that picture. And then inflation is a big jump. Here we don't know what's happening. And when you talk about the Big Bang, well, particle physicists like to define the Big Bang as actually the end of inflation. 
So if you want to define it like that, or you want to say t equals zero, it's fine. I'm not going to you know say anything beyond one second after the Big Bang anyway. It's a whole second after. Oh. Yeah. So so particle theorists like to call the Big Bang as happening when inflation finished, and we have this period of reheating. But how inflation started, how it ended, what reheating is, is all unclear. OK, so and this is why, if you can measure, then there is a neutrino background all around us, just like the CMB. You just can't detect it because we can't detect neutrinos, because they pass through the Earth and you know don't do anything. If you could detect the neutrino background, you would probe what the universe was doing one second after the Big Bang. Right now, we have a probe of what the universe was doing about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and that's the CMB. So that's the earliest picture we can see now. Okay? So that's why it's so cool if you could measure the cosmic neutrino background. Okay, so. I hope I'm not instigating people to switch into cosmology, but <laughs> it's really cool. OK, so we have E plus and E minus annihilation. And what that means is that before, so this is happening around 2 times 10 to the 9. And again, I'll define Z in a second. We had these E plus E minus particles all in this relativistic soup. But then the temperature dropped so much that 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 the back reaction can't happen because this is about the ener the mass of the electron. So it's in equilibrium when E plus E minus can annihilate into photons, and then that back reaction can happen. Photons can generate E plus E minus. But when the universe cools so much, you can't have that back reaction anymore. It freezes out. And then you have a last E plus E minus annihilation that dumps energy into the thermal bath. There's actually it does cause a discontinuity when that energy gets dumped in, so you need to calculate for it. And then you don't anymore have these E plus E minus floating around. And then we have what we call BBN, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Let me write it out. Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. And this is happening shortly after E plus E min minus annihilation. And now to set the scale in time, this is three minutes after the Big Bang. OK, so we're still just talking, you know, very quick after. Yeah. No, uh, baryogenesis happened before, like, I think, believe like in here, like I have prior to everything here. And I know I can't tell you the time period. Sometime ten to the minus nine. It's somewhere I guess after inflation and then before anything that I'm talking about here that that had to happen. And that is what caused the asymmetry between the matter and the antimatter. So prior to here. Prior to, think of this as like all of this is explaining L, uh, known particle physics, right? So anything that we don't know in particle physics is talking about earlier times. Okay. During this time in the first three minutes, you're forming nuclei. So hydrogen is simple because that's just a proton, but this is where helium is going to form. Okay, and to get to helium, helium has um, atomic number of four, right? Because it's got the two protons and the two neutrons, two proton, two protons and two neutrons, and the hydrogen has uh, just one proton. 
And to get to helium, it's not so simple because you've got the protons hanging around, but you need the universe to cool enough that the pro, you know, that, that this combination can all bind together, right? Two protons and two neutrons. And it's not going to happen unless you have some intermediate steps, like, you know, the A equals two and A equals three elements. And so that's what happens here. And then basically everything, it's a, basically, um, ev whatever n neutrons are left in the universe all go into helium, and then anything else decays away. And there's no A equal 5 stable element, so that's why this becomes a stopping point. So no stable A equals 5. So BBN is basically, um, you get a little of A equals 6 and 7, that's the lithium stuff, and um, you get some beryllium. And then again, there's no stable A equals 8. So you get a little 6 and 7, and then 8. Basically, you can't get beyond 8. And the universe is cool too much, right? So you may ask yourself, well, how am I here? Like, how do I exist? How does carbon exist? There's nothing I'm never, you know, when am I going to get to a dense enough state that I can smash together so many things to make carbon? Where does that happen? Stars. So that's why stars are so critical, because without them, we're just going to have hydrogen and helium. And BBN completely explains why the universe is 25% um, helium and 75% hydrogen. And basically, stars are making like a super teeny tiny rest of the percent. Basically, you know, very tiny percentage. So that's, that's us the extra. Okay, what is redshift? So, redshift, so this expansion parameter equals 1, one over 1 plus c. Okay? At the Big Bang, or whatever you want to call Big Bang, right now I'm not, let's not worry about the twiddle fraction of a percent. The way this is conventionally defined is that this is zero. Obviously it doesn't make, you know, 100% sense. And today, A is 1. So this is a convention. So today A is 1 and Z equals 0. And now you can see when my Z's are higher and higher, I'm talking about when the universe was smaller and smaller, which means earlier and earlier times because of my A of T is T the half thing. And we can also define Z because I said that um, the temperature of the universe, this is inverse the temperature of the universe. Then we can also say that Z equals my temperature today, well, the temperature at some early time, divided by my C and B temperature today, minus 1. Okay? where today we measure the C and B as 2.726 Kelvin. Okay, that's Z. Now, the early universe, let's see how much time I have. Let's erase some stuff. So if you do some math starting from a relativistic plasma and take out your stat mech, then you can easily, relatively easily, or just look it up, um, get to this point that this C 
CMB temperature at early times is going to be given by this. 1.56 G star, which I'll explain in a second, minus 1 fourth, 1 second, T, and MeV. Okay. So, in the early universe. Can you see that okay, the equation? Okay. Okay. So just some math here um, should be in any Colbin Turner or a good text, a relatively good textbook. And Scott will be giving you a talk next week. He'll be giving you a set of lectures next week. But Scott Dodelson has a book called Modern Cosmology, and um, it's pretty good, especially for stuff we'll talk about in the next lecture, like the perturbed universe. He goes through all the calculations. Um, so it's also free on the internet. So you search the internet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, you can find it. So after E plus E minus annihilation, so the G star is telling us how many degrees of freedom we have, which is going to be related to how many particles are around and, um, and how many degrees of freedom each particle has. So after E plus E9 initial annihilation, that G star is 3.36. Actually, it's technically 3.38, but most people just say 3.36. That's subtlety. So the reason is that after E plus annihilation, minus annihilation, I told you, you don't have these guys anymore, E plus and E minus. So the things that you have floating around in this bath are photons. Um, and neutrinos. 1.5 for neutrinos. And the photons is because there are these two, uh, the two, oh, two polarization states. And the neutrinos, this is an effective number. that one can derive. But the point is that 60% uh, of our radiation is coming from photons and 40% from neutrinos. And everything else like dark matter, baryon, um, when we're talking about protons and neutrons, well, those are too heavy to contribute to the radiation, which is dominating the dynamics at early time. OK. So because of this, then we get the T is going to be 1.151 1 second T MeV. And the neutrinos decouple at 1 second when the temperature is about an MeV in the universe. So if you want to get a sense of how things drop when the universe is about 100 keV at two minutes, then let's see, one keV at two weeks. And when it gets down to one eV, that's 40,000 years, just to give you a sense. Okay, so today, T temperature of the, t yeah, and that's why this is like an effective number, because the temperature of the neutrino bath is different, because the neutrinos decoupled 
Where did I write it down? The neutrinos decoupled here and then had a certain um, bath, like temperature of their bath, and then you dumped extra energy in with E plus E minus. So that's why the C and B temperature, the photon temperature is higher. It's 2.726 Kelvin, and the neutrino bath temperature is lower. Forget the number, it's one point something Kelvin, okay? So as you approach the one second, all the than one second, there is a discrete jump of the temperature? No, not at neutrino decoupling, at E plus E minus annihilation. So one second is, e, is a neutrino decoupling, but there's no temperature jump. The neutrinos just continue, but just don't interact. What do you mean the extra question goes out of the bath and there is jump? That's right. No, the temperature always falls as 1 over A. There, there is an influx of energy, and effectively it does look like a jump. It's over a small enough time scale. The temperature after that still falls as 1 over A. It's not like it fo fun follows some other function. Yeah? I was going to say it's just that you have to conserve complement. Exactly. So if there is a temperature, yep. the overall complement entropy. Yep. 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 You conserve entropy, and that's how you get it. Um. If you have more neutrinos, what do you mean by that? Well, the neutrinos are in thermal equilibrium with the photons prior to decoupling, so they have the same temperature. But then once they decouple, there's no mechanism for that temperature to change because they've decoupled now thermally from everything else. And now if you've literally dumped in energy to cause the thermal bath of the photons to increase, just naturally it will just, and then nothing changes the photon bath temperature after, so it will just be higher. Uh, I have minus one four, but let's discuss that in coffee break if that's a typo. Could very well be typo. Okay. So, okay. Energy. So, w what's our energy density in the CMB today? Okay. So, we get that from Stefan Boltzmann law. So we just have our neutrino temperature today. This is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And that tells us the energy density in the CMB today. Okay? That's Stefan Boltzmann. Now, if I write this, so I'm going to introduce something called a critical density. So I'm going to make, so this is the, okay. When people make little comma zeros, they mean today. So if I do like energy density, like photons, comma zero today, and that's my like CMB today. And when I say C0, this is the critical density. Today. Now, what the critical density is, is it's the energy density that the universe must have, total, adding up all the components, matter, radiation, everything, for the geometry to be flat four parallel lines to go straight because because GR ties energy and matter to space-time we have a particular density of the universe that allows that geometry to be flat that's called a critical density it is a function of time 
or redshift or temperature, however you want to think about it. So that's why I have to put comma zero. Critical density today is not the same as the critical density earlier. Okay, yes. Because, because of the weak interaction, they are um, coupled to the protons in the, uh, so the answer is yes, very well understood. And they are coupled to the protons and the neutrons through the weak interaction. And then you, you calculate those reaction rates and you calculate how fast the universe is expanding. And at one second, that reaction freezes out. The, the rates are not high enough. Um, and the expansion of the universe takes over. So you cannot, like basically, imagine if everybody's in this room and I'm like interacting with everybody, but now if the room like becomes 50 times the size, I cannot find anybody. Like you've all expanded out and I can't like re interact with the next guy and, you know, and have that reaction. So that's why it freezes out. Okay, okay, so. So today, if we want to know what the critical density is, it's uh, 5200 MeV minus cubed. So the photon density today is a very tiny fraction of our critical density today. Okay? However, the mean photon energy so that's going to be the mean energy, or energy per CMB photon. is also really tiny, 6.34 times 10 to the minus 4 EV. Okay? So if I put these two together, that means that I have a huge number of CMB photons. 4.11 times 10 to the 8 meters cubed. This is how many CMB photons are like impacting your body, your meter cube body, you know, at any moment. So CMB photons, CMB number density. Now, what's the situation for baryons? So, so Scott is going to cover, so I think Scott will go into the FRW metric in more detail, and he'll cover um, BBN more. But what I'll say is that um, what BBN tells us basically is um, as a function of how many baryons are in the universe, the density of baryons, I can tell you exactly how much hydrogen and helium should be in the universe. And then what I can do is I can go out and I can measure the amounts of hydrogen and helium in the universe. And that tells me what the original density of baryons was. Okay, so BBN is the theory of BBN is really powerful because um, it tells us the initial abundance of baryons in the universe. So, and it's also another linchpin for the hot Big Bang model. The fact that um, all the theory works so well, and then I can predict the number of baryons early on, and then I can measure it completely independently with the CMB and that they match is all leading to this whole consistency of this hot Big Bang model. So BBN plus the CMB gives us that picture. So so if I know the baryons early on, and then I have a sense of how the temperature has dropped, then I know the baryons today. Why is that? Because if, if I know the density early on, 
the, any type of matter, any type of matter that I have is just going to fall as a to the minus 3 because this is how my volume increases. So I haven't changed the number of baryons in the universe. I've just changed the volume of space and my density of baryons or of cold dark matter, any type of non-relativistic matter, will just fall as a to the minus q. So that's why I know my baryons today. And now you must be asking, well, what is this omega thing here? Um, where omega is my energy density of my component, so let's say in this case baryons, so if I have omega b baryons, to my critical density. That's that omega character. So if ever you see in the Planck par papers this parameter, it just means density of that component to critical, and usually Planck will always, or any, usually we always drop the comma zero, but if ever you see it in Planck papers, they mean today. So if I know my energy density of baryons early on, I know it today if I know how A has dropped. And I can get this value just from BBN, right? I don't even need this C and B for this. So let's just put a BBN here. And what else can I tell you? Oh, and people often write, people will often do this and set C equals zero. So they'll use matter density interchangeable with energy density. Okay. Okay. So if we have that, then we have the density of baryons today equals this quantity we know from BBN or the CMB times are critical. And that's going to be 210 MeV per megaparsec cubed. So this, this is telling us, this is 800 times the critical, oh sorry, this is 800 times more than the photon density. So a lot more of our dynamics today is determined by baryons and actually cold dark matter because what determines the dynamics is the energy density of the component. Radiation today determines very little of the dynamics. This is a big M. Oh, uh, no, 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 meters, meters, meters. We have, we, megaparsecs I'll say is MPC if I do that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Okay, now, what is the number density of baryons? Well, that's going to be our 210 MeV per meter cubed divided by our mass of our proton, because roughly all the baryons are in protons. And that's going to be 0 0.22 meters cubed. So very few baryons, right? You're an anomaly. So the number density of baryons is much, much less than the number density of photons. Okay? And that's a little bit, that's important for understanding why we see the CMB at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So that's why I'm explaining this. So I can actually calculate what my baryon to photon ratio is. So we define this parameter as eta. Later we'll also use eta for something else, so, but we can use eta for this now. 
So a baryon to photon ratio is about 5 times 10 to the minus 10. So a lot more baryons to photons. Sorry, a lot more photons to baryons. Great question. So for BBN, what I would do is I have, um, so I would measure the abundance of helium and hydrogen, etc., today. And then I have my theory for how those abundances relate to the baryon density early on. And now you're asking, so. The value today, because it's calm as it. I can, no, but he's asking how do I, if I know the value at the time of, um, at the time of BBN, how do I know what it is today? And the way, sort of maybe the simplest explanation for that is that I know the time at which BBN is happening, uh, sorry, the temperature, which is about 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So, I mean, the, the BBN theory is, re is very precise, and you exactly know the temperature at which that's happening, and then I know my temperature today. So I know how A has fallen. I don't need, I don't need to know the exact trajectory of how it happened, but I know A is 1 today because of my convention, and I can know A early on just by the temperature early on. So the temperature early on is setting A. How I get to that um, is different with different dynamics. So when the universe is radiation dominated, A is going to change its T to the 1 half. When it's matter dominated, it's going to change its T to the 2 thirds. But I only need to know endpoints, I would argue. Right, but the baryon energy density early on, I get directly from when I measure. Um, that, that is my BBN theory. The baryon density early on um, will set the universal abundance of hydrogen and helium, and nothing's going to change that. I didn't mention that point. So when helium is formed, all the free neutrons in the universe go into helium. All the other, whatever neutrons did not go into helium decay away immediately. Neutrons on their own decay in like 15 minutes. They're gone. So those initial abundances of hydrogen and helium are frozen. Okay, that, sorry, that, that part I didn't say. Okay, great. So, now we know the neutron to um, baryon to photon ratio. So, what happens at early times? So, during the radiation era, the number of electrons equals the number of baryons. So by baryons, I'm loosely meaning protons. But the number of electrons equals the number of protons because the universe is neutral. Okay? And that equals the baryons today divided by A cubed. Okay? So that, that was what I was meaning by just needing to know the endpoints. Okay, what is going to happen to photons as they're moving around? So photon is going to 
try and move in a straight line, and it's going to scatter off an electron. It's not going to scatter off a proton, right? The cross section is too small. So it's going to scatter off an electron with a mean free path given by this, where this is the Compton cross section. Okay? So mean free path of photon. And the rate at which scattering happens is given by C over lambda, right? So the photons are moving at the speed of light. The rate at which they're going to scatter off an electron is given by Ne um, cross section E times C. Bah, it's a big C. Speed of light. Okay, so rate at which photon scatters. Okay, and you can sort of see this is a sigma E, which is the Compton cross section. So let me write that some more. Sigma E equals Compton cross section. Okay, so you can start to see that why this is critical for understanding what is the time period of the photograph we're taking when we image the CMB. So let me write over here. Yeah. Is Compton People use them interchangeably. Um, um, when people use so when people use either Thompson or Compton, my understanding is it's more the energies of the photon and the particle that we're talking about, not whether it's elastic or inelastic. People often use them interchangeably. Um, the Dodelson book says Compton. I've seen it as Thompson. You know, I, I mean. <coughs> It's scattering of photons off electrons. Okay. So what we want to do is figure out how tightly coupled these photons are. Okay. So let me get to the end of this page, <laughs> and then we will we'll cut. We'll cut. So just um, so let's see what's happening. So let us calculate this rate now that we've done all this hard work. So we have we have n baryons, we have this cross section times the speed of light divided by a cubed and that's going to give us 4.4 .4 times 10 to the minus 21 inverse seconds divided by a cubed. Now Early on, before, so early on when we're in the radiation era, I'm just going to say right now that A, let's pick a number around A of 10 to the minus 5 and explore what is happening during that time. Okay, so I'm just going to pick a time where the universe is reasonably small, and I'm going to say let's see what's happening then. Okay? So then... This is happening at 4.4 .4 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse seconds. Which means that a photon is scattering off electron about three times per week. Okay? Doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a lot. So what are we going to compare this with? We're going to compare it with how fast the universe is expanding. So photons 
stay coupled to the electrons and the protons, because the protons and the electrons are coupled, when this parameter, this rate, is much, much bigger than h. We haven't defined h yet. It's this Hubble parameter where h equals a dot over a. So h is a parameter that's characterizing how fast the universe is expanding. But when the rate is much, much bigger than that expansion per second, right? The expansion is also in units of uh, per second. Then the reaction happens. But when this is the other way around, we say the reaction freezes out. So when a equals when a equals 10 to the minus 5, we have radiation domination. And I just know that because I've gone backwards a little and calculated things. So I know that that's an epoch of radiation domination. So when we have this, then radiation domination. And we go to our FRW metric. And all it's going to tell us is that during the time of radiation domination, I can throw out the other matter components. I can throw out cold dark matter, baryons, everything else, because they're not dominating the dynamics. And I'm just going to have the, the amount of radiation today divided by the critical density divided by A4 equals that. And why A4? Because radiation, unlike matter, falls as a to the minus 4, not a to the minus 3. That's because I have a volume expansion factor. But as the universe expands, the energy of my photon falls as 1 over a as well. It gets redshifted. So the wavelength expands by 1 over a. So that's why I pick up my other factor of a. So I get this, which gives me that h is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10 inverse seconds. And that's plugging in a measurement of h naught that I have today. Right? I know I'm using my data today. So if I plugged in my h naught measurement today and my omega r0 measurement today, and I plugged in a equals 10 to the minus 5, then I get h equals this. And what you can see is that let's see. Oh, here. So what I'm comparing is this here, one second, with this. And this is bigger, much, much bigger than that. Okay? So that implies I write it on. Let me write it nicely. My last sentence. I'll say it here. The rate is much, much bigger than H, and photons are well coupled to electrons. So this is what's happening early on. And until this stops to happen, we're not going to see a CMB. So early on, every time a photon is trying to move in one direction, it keeps getting bounced backwards by an electron. And it's never going to come to us. Okay, So that's where we'll leave off. And then next time, we'll explain what is the physics that happens that allows the photons to come to us. And then we'll talk about more stuff beyond that. Okay. Okay. So. That's it. Okay. What I'm saying is that there is a, there is of course a freeze out of this. Yeah. But then this is happening when the B 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.